I was born into a world full of war talk. There was war talk everywhere. It was 1948, three years after the Second World War. And the first place I lived was, was a little estate in Belfast that had been specially built for war veterans. And, oh, this is me here before I had a beard with my parents uh, in our a little estate. And my family served in all of the forces during the war. My dad was in the Royal Navy. That's him there in Singapore. And he died from the effects of war when I was still quite young. Uh, this is my uncle, Teddy Doherty. This was just after he was captured, uh, was a prisoner of war. You can see the defiant look in his face there. And my uncle Johnny was in the Royal Air Force. He was in one of those big, uh, huge bombers as a, as a gunner, and he was shot down in the war, but he survived. But you know, the thing was that nobody talked about the killing bit. They talked about the war a lot, but it was not about the killing. Like the men would all talk about some great gambling thing they'd done, or they'd met friends and had a really drunken evening, or they had some sort of motor motorcycle event. My dad met Joe Lewis, the world championship boxer. And the women, they would talk about things like, my mum would talk about having to draw a stripe up the back of her leg to pretend she had nylon stockings because there were no nylon stockings in those days. Or they would talk about meeting a GI in, you know, in Northern Ireland and getting stockings from them. Or they'd talk about some romantic evening during the Blitz when there was bombing and there was a blackout and they would have little candles lit and so they would all sing war songs together. And it was sort of all said in a romantic way. And they didn't talk about the friends who had died or any of the killing. It was really quite strange. And in the state I lived, there were lots of people with one arm and one leg, and they didn't. Talk, I learned not to ask why. It was very strange. And it, but it did leak out, especially on Remembrance Sunday. That was once a year, as we have in Sheffield here. And Remembrance Sunday, I'd be standing in the diamond with all these big, strong men. And my uncle, I remember my uncle Jack with his black coat on, his red poppy, and looking up at him. And it was very moving. There'd be tears streaming down his face as, as he stood there listening to the ceremony. But he'd just wipe the tears away and off they'd go. And I learned that what they really, that generation really suffered silent tears and suffered in silence for all those people who were killed during the war. But for myself, it's not surprising that surrounded by all this war, war movies on the TV every, every week and in the cinemas, that I became quite obsessed with the military myself as a little boy. My big thing was toy soldiers. I took toy soldiers everywhere with me. People in Northern Ireland still ask me if I have my toy soldiers. I was quite well known for it. I was compelled by it. My grandmother's uh, carpet was like a campaign zone with mountains made of blankets and pillows. I had planes, I had tanks, I had submarines. I had soldiers from Australia, American Marines, uh, Gurkhas, everything you could imagine. I just played with them all the time. I learned all the military ranks and all their equivalences for forces around the world. In fact, when I was a teenager, I was quite embarrassed by it, and I had to give all my soldiers away to young friends, otherwise I'd still be playing with them today. I had to get rid of them. Now, when I was a teenager, though, I became a musician, so I played guitar, and I made most of my living playing in Irish show bands during my teen years, and I forgot all about war. But, but then, by the late 60s, it was very cool to be anti-war. That was the Vietnam War days. All the songs, I, I, all the songs of all the, all the great bands at the time were all anti-war. And there's one that really sticks in my head, and it was about the notorious CIA. And it went something like, Who can kill a general in his bed? CIA, CIA man, hey man, CIA. And the thing about the CIA was that they assassinated thousands of people at that time. And Gen uh, President Ford, after the, after the Vietnam War, set up an executive order because he said America should take the moral high ground. They should stop this kind of assassination. And so he set up an executive order that's still in force today to stop this kind of assassination. Now, after that, I got into study and I became an academic and I didn't get into any street campaigns, any street protests or anything else. I just had my head down working myself stupid for 30 years. And I went through many disciplines and ended up with my true love of a discipline, which is robotics. It brought all my knowledge together and I absolutely loved it. I, you know, it was like playing with toy soldiers again. 
I was, I was just, uh, did a lot of research on machine learning, that was my big thing. And then I ran large scale museum exhibitions, for instance, out at Magna here. And I also took robot competitions around the world to children. And I know that the little Noel Shark, he would really have loved that. He would have loved to have known of the future that I was, that I was working on. Because my hero in my days of a toy soldier was from a comic which you probably all know called The Beano. And it was General Jumbo, if you remember him. Okay, here he is. Now, General Jumbo, unlike me, I was very envious of him because I had to move my toy soldiers around by hand. But he had these robotic toy soldiers, so he flew them around the place, jets. He fought crime every week, never killed anybody, but he fought criminals and he beat up bullies and that sort of thing. So I really liked that. And that was my inspiration in terms of robotics, except I never took military funding. I wasn't interested in working for the military at all. So I carried on with my robotics. But the big eye-opener for me, really, was in about 2005, 2006. I was very much in the public eye with my work. And journalists started asking me about military robotics. And I knew nothing about them, really. I heard about drones, and I knew a little bit about bomb disposal coming from Northern Ireland, but nothing else. So I thought I'd go off and look at the internet for a couple of hours, and then I could answer questions. Well, that couple of hours turned into seven months of solid research. I was horrified by what I read. I was really shocked as a robotics person. It was like, especially the American roadmaps and military plans, I read all of them. They're an open information society, and they were all about autonomous killing machines that could go out, find their own targets, and kill them themselves. And people just weren't aware of this. And I was shocked because these guys didn't seem to understand the limitations of robotics. They were thinking in science fiction land in some sort of way. It was absolutely disgraceful. So what could I do? as an academic? Well, very little, I thought. But I'll show you first of all where it started. They're very like current General Jumbo. They're remote controlled. I'm sure you've seen these. They're drones, first used by the CIA in 2002 in Somalia. This is edited, of course. Now, these are remote controlled, as I said. But unlike General Jumbo, he's really close to the action. These guys are like, you know, seven and a half thousand miles away. So there's a kind of buffer there between them and the action, a sort of moral buffer, so they can do that. But what really gets me about this is the CIA are using them in countries that the United States is not at war with. They call it targeted killings now rather than assassination, so the presidential order doesn't count. They're flying around Africa, Somalia, and... Uh, Mali, Pakistan, and killing, killing, you know, known terrorists. But every time they strike, lots of children are killed. The numbers are really piling up of civilians who are being killed by the CIA. And I didn't think I was going to be standing in front of an audience here 40 years after the Fug song with new lyrics. Who's flying drones over Pakistan? Who's killing children in Africa? CIA man, hey man, CIA, CIA man. X-47B, the technological dream machine that is the future of U.S. Navy unmanned aviation. The X-47B has been designed for use aboard Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. Its tailless batwing shape will make it the stealthiest unmanned system ever to take to the skies. This is going to be the replacement for drones. These are fully autonomous. There's nobody remote controlling them. They can go out. They can select their own targets and kill them themselves. And they're destined for the Pacific round about 20 aircraft carriers in the Pacific round about 2020. And it's absolutely disgraceful, I think. Um, they talk about them being dream machines. Well, General Drum Jumbo couldn't even have dreamt of that technology. It's like a high-tech toy. And it's not just in the air either. They're on the ground as well, look. This is the crusher. Made by, developed by DARPA. DARPA are the research wing of the Pentagon. And the, it's a brilliant machine, though, as a roboticist. I really like it. Uh, but it's called the Crusher because it can crush Cadillacs. The Army teamed up with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, to create the Crusher. And it doesn't stop there either. They've got autonomous submarines. 
hunt submarine hunting submarines, which are phase two of testing. And it's not just the USA. They're the most open society about it. Israel are developing the capabilities. China have been working on an air-to-air -air autonomous aircraft for aircraft fighting. And these are fast subsonic. They're not like the drones. And the United States even has a supersonic Falcon, which can travel at 13,000 miles an hour. The idea is to get a, an unmanned combat aircraft anywhere on the planet within a one-hour window really fast-paced. Russia have got the SCAT, and the UK, we've got the Mantis already, and we're about to test, you've moved my slide forward, we're about to test the, um, the Tyrannus, which God of Thunder, and that's a really, really nasty machine. It's an intercontinental combat aircraft, fully autonomous again, no, nobody on board, no pilots on board. So what's wrong with this? Well, the idea behind it is, of course, is so that we can have bloodless wars. We can send robots out to do our killing for us. But it's not bloodless for everybody, obviously. It's not bloodless for you, the person being received from it. And the idea, the idea of bloodless means that um, it means that we don't get killed. We don't send our young men out to get killed. And that's a good thing. But isn't it much better not to have stupid wars in the first place, and then we won't be sending out our young men? I have friends in Afghanistan, and I don't want to see body bags coming home, but the threat of body bags coming home inhibits us from going into pointless conflicts. What's going to inhibit us with these? These are going to destabilize world security. They're going to trigger unintentional wars. And also, the United States talks about having swarms of them. And so they're going to have swarms of robots meeting swarms of robots, because there's no doubt there's going to be proliferation. 76 countries already have drones now. There's going to be a massive arms race. Israel's sold 4.6 billions worth of drones in the last eight years. This is a multi-billion dollar thing. There's big companies involved, national investment. So it's a really bad thing. But from a robotics point of view, what horrified me to begin with was the idea that using robots, you know, a robot can't discriminate between a combatant and a civilian. They can barely tell the difference between a car and a human. And so how is that going to work? Um, they can't, you, I just have these visions in my head. Ro robots can't reason at all. And I would go to bed at night and I'd really be thinking about this and I'd have horrible dreams about children a child with a toy gun running out in front of a soldier, his mother screaming at him to come back. A soldier would understand that setting, a robot wouldn't, and think, oh, there's something happening here, and gun down the child, and I could see children just wounded like that. What about proportional response, the cornerstone of the Geneva Convention? It's permissible more to kill some civilians when you're killing, when you're killing soldiers or targets, but that has to be directly proportional to military advantage. Military advantage is an abstract concept. It takes a very experienced commander to know what that is. A robot doesn't have that kind of reasoning power. And even if it could make the calculation, would we really want robots to be making that calculation? Isn't it the ultimate human indignity to have a machine decide which civilians are going to die for some target? That just isn't right. A human commander can be held accountable. A robot can't be held accountable. It hasn't got moral agency and it muddies up the whole chain of command and accountability completely. Because, you know, commanders don't want these. When I go out and talk to the military, they say, we don't want these. Um, because who's going to be held responsible? It can't be the commander. There could be a software glitch. It could be hacked. It could be spoofed. It could be a mechanical failure. It could take a bullet. So it just muddies up that whole, that whole chain. Now, what could I do? I'm, I wasn't an activist. I am now, though. Because of this, I'm an activist, but I wasn't. I was just an academic. So what all I could do was talk to journalists a lot about it, try and raise public awareness like I'm trying to do today. I wrote articles for The Guardian, for The Telegraph, and then invites started pouring in from militaries around the world. So I spent an awful lot of time with militaries now, which I never did before. So all that playing with toy soldiers was actually quite helpful, except these, were, these guys were real. And I talk a lot to intelligence services and, and policy makers but, but I have no way of, of getting governments to talk to each other, which is the important bit. I couldn't do that. And I got together in 2009 with academics from Australia, Germany, and America, and we set up the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, ICRAC, with the specific goal of getting governments to talk to each other about it, just chat about it in some way. But we couldn't do that. We did lots of writing and talking, but nothing else. But a big breakthrough came for us last year, last October, 
we found a group of very powerful, prominent NGOs who, were, who had similar goals to us. It was the people who managed to get cluster munitions banned and landmines banned. And this is our meeting in New York. You can see here at the front, there's a Nobel Peace Laureate, Jodie Williams, who's head of the Women's Nobel Initiative. On the other side of me is uh, Ambassador Jantha, who's president of Pugwash, another Nobel Peace Prize winning organization. There's Human Rights Watch here, a giant organization. We've got IV Pax Christi, Harvard Law Clinic, that's landmine action. And these guys here are the great Article 36 from the UK. And since then, lots more NGOs have joined us. We have the international, uh, Amnesty International spreading the word throughout the world. And we have the wonderful Code Pink. So we decided to have a campaign to stop the killer robots. And it was launched in Parliament in April 23rd this year. And governments are starting to tittle-tattle and chatter a bit about it. And I'm starting to go now and talk to foreign offices and lots of diplomats. But a real milestone happened. On the 29th of April this year, the Special Rapporteur of the UN went to the U United Nations Human Rights Council with a report asking for a complete worldwide moratorium on lethal autonomous robots. That's Christoph Haynes. And now the conversation really began in earnest, and lots of countries are actually talking to each other. But a moratorium isn't good enough for us. It's not satisfactory. Because even the UK, the UK is the one country that stood up and said, we're not going to sign a moratorium. We're going to develop these weapons, but honestly, we're always going to have a human supervisor somewhere in the loop, but where in the loop, to make sure that the targets are correct. America's been the same. They say, you can trust us. Sure we can. CIA man, hey man. So I really worry about the future. I worry here about my youngest grandchildren. This is Ron and Lila. And what's going to happen to them? Governments last for four or five years and then they keep changing. These are legacy systems. One government can say whatever it likes, oh, we're not going to use them and stuff. But the next government inherits them and they're very likely to use them. And really, I don't want to ha have them suffer the same tight, silent tears as their their great-grandfather and their great-uncles. So I think we should really collectively get together, really, the people of Sheffield and the people of the rest of the world, and try to stop this continuous automation of warfare. It's becoming a factory of death and slaughter, and we can actually stop that. How are we ever going to stop warfare while we have this? So I'm asking people to stop the killer robots. Stop the killer robots. Thank you.